yes, today I just want to welcome everybody to uh, the first ever online Open Research uh, London event. Uh, typically, these are held at the uh, prestigious Francis Crick Institute, where we drink house red wine and eat lots of peanuts. Um, but today is the first live uh, um, webinar version of, of this. Um, and today we're going to talk about micro publications. Um, but before I uh, kick off to that, I'm going to um, just talk about uh, what the proceedings and how we're going to um, do this. So um, to introduce myself, I'm Michael Markey. I'm the di publishing director at F1000. Uh, and we have uh, flirted quite a lot with micro publications and, and different ways of, of publishing. So I uh, was very uh, excited to be invited to, to chair this from, from the Open Research London group. Um, the next um, thing that I want to talk about is how this is going to work. So um, we've got four great speakers, all talking about uh, different types of, of micro publications, be it uh, some theory around how we should publish uh, and lots of different products that, that are trying to, to do something a little bit different with regards to disseminating research. Um, so each talk will take around 10 minutes um, and uh, afterwards, we're going to have plenty of time for questions, so, so do keep them there um, ready for, for, for that. Um, if you do have any questions, if you just put them in the chat, I am hopefully going to be monitoring that um, uh, efficiently uh, to ask questions. Uh, and I'll also, um, on the slide, you can see that these, there's a Twitter hashtag. Uh, we're going to be live tweeting the event, and uh, if there are any questions you want to ask via Twitter, I shall try and keep my eye on that too, although multitasking is difficult in these types of events. Um, so what I also just wanted to do now is also um, just kind of put a prelude to, to what we are talking about. So when we're talking about micro publications, I guess for me, uh, what we're talking about is, is sharing research in, in smaller, more incremental units, um, because not, Research is not journal shaped, and that is the way we share research in a specific way, a journal way where we give the introduction, the methods, uh, the results and the conclusion. But that's not how research happens in a lab. And so there's lots of different ways where you can think about how to share um, research. And that can be things that don't necessarily make a research story. So an observation or a finding or the way that we collect research in, in the research labs ourselves is not again, done in such a linear way that, that, that a journal um, um, has. So what this is going to do today is talk about different ways and, and we're going to see different um, products and, and, and ideas of, of how to share research in, in a different way. And hopefully when we have some conversation towards the end, I want to kind of see, will these resonate with researchers? Do we think that, that we can complement or even replace traditional journals? And also, does this idea of micro publications help us make things more human, uh, more machine readable as, as in human readable? So there's quite a few ideas that, that I'd like to get across in the, in the Q&A session. But I'm going to pass over to uh, our expert speakers now. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, and our first speaker is uh, always entertaining, uh, Kave Bazargan, who's, going, who's the director of River Valley's Technology. And he's going to start us off with something a bit more thoughtful and talk about what is the, or is there a better way to share, uh, communicate research. So, uh, Kave, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, thank you. You're on mute, Kave. Forgive me, I, I knew I'd get something wrong. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, is there a better way to communicate research? Very briefly about River Valley, uh, our vision is to accelerate the communication of research. And that really is exactly what we're talking about today how to accelerate the communication of research, uh, whether it's by publication, whether it's by talking in a pub, writing something, shouting in, a, in the town square, whatever. <clears throat> so we've been over 30 years in the scholarly publishing industry. 
since 88, we've been typesetting STM content. And since about 10 years ago, we are concentrated on making platforms for publishing. Everything from uh, submission to peer review to uh, author correction to typesetting to the final hosting. So we have an end-to-end -end, uh, system with platforms. And we're always thinking, what more can we do with our platforms? And in addition, we, we tend to sit down with the staff uh, when there's some free time and think, uh, just blue sky ideas. What can we do? Is there anything we can do better? And what I'm going to say today is not going to change everything tomorrow or in the next few years, maybe in the next 10 years, who knows? It's just ideas. So a little bit about me. I'm a physicist. My background is physics. I uh, um, studied at Imperial College London did my research in display holography. <clears throat> and the idea was to improve the realism or the clarity or the true uh, um, rendition of 3D holograms. And it was some theory and some experiment. Um, and holograms is, the word hologram is really misused these days. If you, uh, um, uh, if you get a chance to see a real true, say white light or laser illuminated hologram, I, I would say that they're lovely to look at the, the 3D images. So I'll tell you a story of my first research publication. I thought if I make it personal, that'll, that, that'll, uh, uh, that'll be more, more clear. Uh, so this is a hologram of me as a young man made by Rob Monday, probably one of the world's best uh, uh, holographers. And you can see that it's a white, that uh, it's basically, it's a piece of glass illuminated with white light. And as you go around, it's absolutely as if someone is sitting there. Um, I'm just going to give you just enough details so that I can, I can make my case if you like. Um, this is called an image plane hologram. And if we look at zoom in on, on one part of the shirt, you can see this part is, is clear and it's sharp, but as you go away from the plane of the hologram, of the glass plate, if you like, it gets more and more blurred. And that is basically uh, any white light hologram is sharp right in the image, but it gets blurred, more and more blurred as you go away. I was making one of these holograms in the lab and I had the, what's called the master hologram and I was projecting it with a laser <clears throat> to, to make this, if you like, image plane hologram. The rays that uh, illuminate that master hologram should be parallel. They're supposed to be parallel, but I thought I didn't have this big lens to, 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 to make this parallel or collimated. So I thought I'd get away with an expanding beam. When I made that, I was expecting to see this image, half in front, half behind with the sharpest in the middle of it sort of cutting through the, the hologram. But when I looked at it, I noticed that the image is actually gone behind. And this was unexpected. I looked in the literature and, and it wasn't right. So I knew I had something. I had something there which was interesting, but I didn't know what, because I was an experimentalist, not a theoretician. There was a guy called Mike Forshaw, uh, a colleague who was much cleverer than I was. Uh, he knew the theory, I said, time to talk to him. So I said to Mike, I said, look, have a look at this, Mike. Um, found something interesting here. What do you think? He said, well, I've never seen that before. But I think it's due to the fact that you didn't collimate the light or make them parallel. And he said, you can actually, you could get a paper out of this. How do I do that? Um, well, you really need for a paper, you need some numbers, you need some references, figures. Uh, then you got to write up the paper. I said, okay, so he gave me instructions. I did the same thing, but this time measuring things. So I got the measurements here, uh, drew some diagrams as to how I did it, found some references. We did that together, I think. I can't remember, to be honest with you. I took a photo of this, uh, the image. It was a sort of wooden carving of Don Quixote. And about six or seven months after I first, if you like, made that discovery, I put discovery in inverted commas because it's not a, a earth shattering discovery, but it's an interesting, was interesting enough 
to publish and we got a short publication in optics communication and this is it this is our paper and this is up to now this is all people know about what we did there's, this is the story there's nothing more so i'm telling you a lot of stuff that i've never told anyone before if you like so what the paper says that it's uh, it's called an image plane hologram with non-image plane motion parallax which is a wonderful sort of um, catchy title that Mike came uh, uh, out with, um, Bazagan and Foreshore. Note that there's no hint as to who did what. What did Bazagan do? What did Foreshore do? Um, and then the, 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 what it says in the abstract is, it is shown that in certain circumstances, it's possible to generate nearly achromatic images which appear to lie completely behind the second hologram. But it doesn't say anything more than that. That's it's very dry, very brief. That's it. There is no other publication to talk about this. So I thought, all right, let's have a look at this. Wouldn't it be nice if we knew who did what? What did Carve do? What did Mike do? Um, what came first? Did we do the experiment first and thought, oh, we got something here? Or um, did, did, did we think, well, we could, let's see if we can make an image behind the hologram. There's no hint of that there. Wouldn't it be nice if the discovery was reported immediately? Say six or seven months, and we didn't have to uh, wait six or seven months. And if more data were available, wavelength chemistry reconstruction like, well, there's, not, there's no hint of that in the paper. We thought it wasn't necessary, but maybe it would have been useful. And if more people can contribute. So is there a way of doing that? Now I've been using a thing called Stack Exchange for a while. And Stack Exchange, if you're not familiar, it's for programmers who ask to ask question, uh, questions and people answer. It's an interesting site. So here it is, is for example, tech I use now and again. Here's a question that's been asked by someone called Lucas uh, four hours ago, as you can see. Uh, and four hours ago, almost immediately, Ebo came along. We don't know who it is, but it's called, the person's name is Ebo, and edited this. And as you can see, five upvotes, five people have said, oh, this is an interesting question. So it's all interactive. And this is the editing that Ebo did, and he just did it to, to make it more readable for people. He didn't have the answer. So E. Greg came along 17 minutes ago, about three and a half hours later, and answered the question and got so far has got one upvote. <clears throat> Why are these people doing this? Because programmers, they want to show that they've got the answer. They want to be recognized by their peers, just like researchers want to be recognized by their peers. And currently, of course, researchers are recognized only by their publications. So a little bit more about Stack Exchange. Users can be pseudonymous. So I can go in and say K1234, no one knows who I am, but of course that person stays a bit like Twitter. There might be a Twitter handle, you don't need to say who you are, but of course it's the same person. You can build a reputation. There's a strict code of conduct. Um, it's moderated by the community and it works very well. Every contribution can be voted up or down. And it's very hard to gain without going into details. Um, and normally it's accurate. If you look up, if you've got a problem with a, with, a, with a programming language, look it up through Google. If you get to Stack Exchange, invariably, that's the best place to find the answer. It works. I find it works. So we thought, let's imagine a site called researchhub.io. Very loosely based on Stack Exchange, not exactly because we're not, it's not programming, it's scientific research. But supposing that I go on there and say, report my re results. I say, hey guys, this is what I found. What do you think? The same day or a couple of days later. Now I will get a, I might get upvotes for experiment te experimental technique. Someone else comes in, this, this person, Peter Davidson says, what ways, uh, laser wavelength did you use? Um, I give the details. Someone, Laz007, says, comes up with three related published papers. Some people vote them for bibliography, and it goes on. Jane Robinson says, look, I found these two comments. 
insight. Then Mike Forshaw comes along and says, uh, Kave, you could do some new numerical tests. I decide to carry them out. And, and someone says, oh, good data gathering. Mike Forshaw says, um, comes up with this theory and explains exactly what happened. And he gets a lot of points for analysis. And you can see, Mike has got, uh, no, people know that Mike did the analysis. People know I did the experiment. Jennifer P comes along and does, confirms the theory by creating the 3D graphs. Ah, oh, good data visualization. And it goes on and on, it never stops, okay? So each person over time builds a reputation in this place. And it's a granular uh, uh, reputation. So we know what they did. And just suppose now that the university is looking to hire someone, experimentalist in holography, who has also got some knowledge of analysis and is a good teacher because they've got to do some uh, uh, teaching. Kave applies, I apply with my CV, but I also uh, put my profile on research up so they can see what, what I've been doing. Maybe Research Hub IO could become, this is just the name I came up with, could be the default site. So that could be the go-to place to see who, who is doing what. Advantages of uh, Research Hub. For, is, for actual, for the research, for the field, there's no delay in publication. As soon as something happens, people actually, it's actually in their interest to go immediately. There's no plagiarization. You, you've heard of the work of Elizabeth Bick, who's got thousands of papers, have been, literally figures have been photoshopped. It doesn't happen here because there are too many eyes looking at this. You can't get away with that. So there are no retractions. Relevant data are always available because the peers will want them. They'll say, hey, can we have the data? For example, the laser, et cetera. Anything relevant, people will ask you. Information is always up to date, it's a, it's a live site. And for researchers, they get granular attribution. So people know that Kave is good at uh, um, um, experiment, but not in, not in theory. I can be pseudonymous, which means there's no bias. So if I'm a young black woman in Botswana and I want to uh, 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 contribute, I can, no one knows who I am. Negative results they get credit too. So for example, if I've made some stupid error in my experiment and on the first day I put that up, someone could point it out and none, none of this would happen. There'd be no further discussion, okay? And also people do what they like best. I could get a reputation without, without rating any papers, no narrative, and it's open and free for all. So you'd think, well, here we are, we're done, we're finished, but, we're not finished because this, this is quite complicated. It's only the, the geeks like myself, if you like, who know what's going on there. It's very difficult to navigate for non-specialists. So if I'm not actually one of those people, I want to see what's going on. I want a narrative that is in the end, a story like I've told you today, we need the story. And that's where the publisher could come in. For the scientists, there could be technical journals where a, a technical a, a, a journalist will explain exactly what happened here. Maybe give a different angle. For the layman, there could be a magazine and readers would pay for the best content. So the vision here, again, it may not happen, but just sort of in the lab, we think the primary source of research information would be on this site, a site. And a publisher would come in and publish what they believe is worth publishing. Another publisher could do the same thing. And multiple publishers could do the same thing. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kave. And that's a really, really good introduction to, to what we want to talk about today um, with some of the rest of the talks. And in the discussion is, you know, what we're saying here is, is we're coming up with the ideas in gradual, granular micro pieces and putting something together towards the end rather than coming out with what people believe is the true narrative. So thank you very much. We, we do have a couple of questions for you, but we will hold them to the end. So um, thanks for kicking us off. Um, next up, uh, I just want to introduce uh, Paul Sternberg, who's 
in LA has got up very early for us this this, uh, this afternoon for us this morning for him uh, and we're going to find out a little bit more about the really really cool site micro publication biology so Paul I'll hand over to you hello hope everybody can hear me yeah we can hear you uh, great we can see your slides you can see slides fantastic okay so I want to talk about our micro publication process uh, project and the the site is micropublication.org or micropublicationbiology.org. Okay, so who am I? It was a really interesting talk, Kavi. Um, but I'll try to, yeah, I'm not going to riff on it too much till later. Um, so I, I've been doing research and, and writing papers for 40 years. And I've been involved in knowledge bases for about 20 years. So that kind of drives what, um, what I'm interested in the motivation here. So there, I kind of view it as three different pro problems in, in scholarly communication. One is, as a researcher and reviewer, um, articles are too complicated. They're, they're too complicated to read, to, to write, to read, or, or, or even to evaluate the reproducibility. And I think as Kavi pointed out, that the more granular you get, the easier it is, the easier it is to, um, to write, read, and, and be reproducible. Now, as a taxpayer, and also as a mentor and program director who watches young careers and people publish, you know, more than half the information doesn't get published. So that's a, that's a big problem. Um, and finally, as a knowledge-based developer, not a knowledgeable developer, um, I, I should go to Stack Exchange more, it'd be more knowledgeable. Um, data and knowledge don't, don't flow into knowledge bases. So that's a big problem that we're concerned with. All right, now let's go back. History, um, I, I think, Kaveh's example was great, but here's another, here's an example of a paper in 1950s, The Structure of DNA, which is one unit of intellectual content. This is Watson and Crick's famous paper. It was based on other data that was published in a, in a longer format by Rosalind Franklin. Um, so there's, you know, even flaws in scholarly communication at that point. You can read lots of books about this, but it was short. There's one figure and it explained what they did. Okay. A modern micropublication, for example, in, in, in our site, would have single figure, single display item, um, basically one type of experiment or, or a simple uh, set of related, you know, related bits of information about an experiment to give a result. So there's the title that are now abstracts. Um, there's a description of why, they did, why it was done, what was found, and then details about how it was done, where the reagents come from, both biologicals and, and chemicals, et cetera. And that unit, which is, a, say, ends up being a couple of pages, sort of like the same length as Kaveh's first paper, um, and uh, allows you to see what's there. Um, it's pretty granular. I'd say one of the striking things we found is that there, there are more authors than we expected, so they're not as granular as, as, uh, as, as Kaveh's argument would like, and I, I agree with that. Um, okay. But where do they fit in the in the data life cycle, knowledge life cycle? Okay, so conventional papers will have a lot of experiments and data sets. Those are interpreted. Some of them are discarded because they're negative or not relevant to the narrative. Then those are filtered by um, as before they get into knowledge bases by what data are included, what, what's of interest, how do they fit ontologies, which are organized controlled vocabularies that allow you to transition between human readable and machine readable information. It's very important. And then you end up with these objects in the knowledge base. Okay, that's what happens. It's kind of, it's slow, it's kludgy. So even if it takes eight months to publish, it might take another six months or a year for that information to get into a knowledge base and accrete it into something that can be used. Um, the fantasy was that the authors would do this during the preparation. So that was kind of our drive for, for this project, which was that the authors would, as their uh, preparing their results for dissemination would use the, the, the filters and match terms and entities to ontologies. And then that would then, from the article, could flow nicely into a knowledge base. Okay. So then for micropublication, what we're trying to do is have it as simple as possible. You have a, a, a type of experiment or data set. It's um, curated by the author. And then simultaneously, it's published and goes to knowledge base. So that would be rapid dissemination. Okay. And the most efficient because the most advanced curation now we're doing is we'll have a paper, we'll use artificial intelligence to 
explore what's in that article, present it back to the author for ver verification. Um, and it's still kind of backwards because this is months or years after the, the, the people did the experiments. So it's better if we could do it as part of the process. Okay, now, um, from my perspective, you know, every day I go to various knowledge bases like WormBase about my, my favorite little microscopic worm or this Alliance of Genome Resources, which is a cross-species platform that we're developing to, to organize research intensive organisms and information about them, focus more on genes and genomes at this point. Okay, um, so, and to, to populate such knowledge bases, which are used by hundreds of thousands of people daily and save uncountable hours, um, you need data curation. And there's two parts to that. One is sort of taking data sets and mapping identifiers and doing the, the it's called janitorial work of cleaning up the data so that it can be used by computers and, and displayed. And the other one is actually taking individual operation uh, observations and getting them into a knowledge graph. And for artificial intelligence to work, it requires this gold standard data. So you need clean data and be that large scale or small. So that's what we'd like to capture. And to do that, we're developing um, smart annotation forms where the author can, uh, or somebody else afterwards, but preferably the author would take the, the article, the software processes it, figures out what are the entities that are used. It'd be nicer if you used, you know, developed it from scratch as you're writing it, but you can take a narrative, turn it into this by, here's a list of entities, you know, A relates to B, and using method C. And then that is accepted and it goes into a knowledge base, right? And that would be creating knowledge graphs, you know, as, as publication happens. So that's the, you know, what we're, we're trying to do. Um, for micropublication as a project, you can go look at the site, um, which I'll put up on the last slide. Um, actually, I think yesterday we published 400 articles, which I think is now more than I've published myself. Um, rejected about 5%. And the turnaround time is not instantaneous like uh, your IO, um, but we're having, you know, on the order of days to a couple of months because it's a long tail. Um, I think the nicest one was literally within less than two days, the authors responded to criticisms, the paper got re-reviewed and published. And the, rap the rapidity of that peer review, which is really important in our mind and, and during the process is that it's granular and you can have an expert who knows that material and can decide is it true or not. And I would say that actually the, the peer review on a, on a per experiment basis is more intense than you know, any other journal I've, I've reviewed for, which are, are many of uh, a whole range because there's, no, there's one type of experiment. There's nowhere to hide, right? But if you have 50 different experiments with you know, 30 supplemental files of various types, they're just not getting rigorously re reviewed. So where are we this? Oh, the other one is just as a, as a mentor, I had a, I had a student who, did, he never quite got the last experiment done for his thesis, went off to Stanford University for postdoc. And then eventually after four years, we decided to do that, to put that last chapter, that last uh, draft paper, it ended up being his five mic linked micro publications. So we're still exploring with how the, how the linkage of different units to create a higher order mag, uh, narrative works, but um, we think that's doable. Okay, so our, this, in, in, in our view, the, be the better scholarly communication would be, you have articles that are s easier to read, write, and ensure reproducibility. And I say easy um, with a caveat that when you get into details and you can see what's, what you need to put in there, all the numbers and, 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 uh, and connections, there are actually lots of them. So it still takes, you know, a few days. Um, and then as a mentor, we now get, the, the data gets published. And as a knowledge base developer, developer, we now see everything flow into knowledge bases seamlessly. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. So, super interesting. And another, another different uh, type of, of micro publication that, that seemingly goes through journal-like tasks such as as I mentioned they're very rigorous peer review too so um, yeah interesting um, to, to ask some questions about that afterwards um, so thank you very much for that um, and our next speaker I just want to introduce uh, Alex Freeman who is uh, the creator of 
um, the much talked about Octopus platform, um, which um, uh, has been recently funded by the UKRI. So um, without further ado, Alex, I let you take the floor. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my slides. All correct? Good. Yes, beautiful graphic. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, uh, Kaveh's done an excellent introduction to um, uh, why uh, Octopus thinks that micro publications are the way to go. My background, I had a career in the media and coming back from um, working in making science documentaries to uh, academia, I was kind of hit with the full horror of the science publishing system and um, thought that really this is a this is a pretty fundamental problem for science it's not just how we disseminate it um so i think there's something wrong with the scientific publishing system that goes right to the heart of what it's trying to do and i think it's that journals are trying to do two jobs at once um they are both trying to disseminate um the findings of research uh, which is a really important um, job and in fact drives probably most of their revenue because I suspect the most popular bits of journals tend to be the news and views. Um, but the incentives of trying to make a communication that is good at disseminating is all about trying to make things attractive and readable and have a, a nice story to tell, which drives a lot of the problematic things such as word counts, publication bias, and a lot of questionable research practices uh, like p-hacking and harking, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The other job that journals are doing is being the primary research record, and they're almost being forced to fulfil this job. It's a rather thankless task. It's kind of being a patent office for establishing priority and being a place for recording the full details of all the methods and all the data and everything that didn't work, as well as the uh, findings that might be of interest to you, say a practitioner, a doctor, an engineer, a politician. And the incentive structure that would make a good, that would incentivize good research are very different. It's a very specialised kind of communication. And I think it's quite natural that the incentive structure of dissemination is bending the incentives of the whole of the science research culture in that direction. And rather than paying um, proper service to the dissemination of scientific findings. And because the primary research record is the main record that of what researchers have done and hence what they get judged on, the bending of this incentive structure towards dissemination is causing this real problem in the research culture and in as assessing and choosing what research gets done, which I think is absolutely critical for the whole of science. So what can we do? Well, I think the answer is to split these two jobs. And that's what Octopus is. It's designed to be the new primary research record to take on that second job leaving journals free to do the first properly. And then we don't have the incentives of good dissemination bending the incentives of good research. And if we can start again with a new primary research record, it allows us to de design it entirely around making the incentive structure work for science. So it's designed, Octopus is designed to maximise the access to primary research, which is kind of easy to do because we can make it digital first and we can make it free to read and free to write and we can build in automatic language translation to remove some of those barriers to access. But we can also change the concept of what a publication unit is. And that's what we're talking about today. And you've heard a lot about and we know that the scientific process naturally comes in a series of steps, one after the other. And we know that each step requires quite different skills and quite different resources. And that forcing people to get right to the end of this process before sharing any of it is causing a lot of the problems that we've already talked about today. And retrospectively forcing a linear narrative and only being able to publish when data supports the hypothesis and making a good readable story is pretty much the key to a lot of the questionable research practices. So in a primary research record free of those dissemination incentives, 
we at Octopus can allow a structure of publication that more closely matches the actual process. And what's different, I think, from a lot of the other micro publication platforms is that it creates this branching structure. Every publication in Octopus has to be linked to a pre-existing one and of the type before it in the chain. So if you're familiar with registered reports as a format, then it's a bit like taking that concept to its ultimate conclusion. So instead of just doing sort of half the paper and getting to the bit before you collect data and then getting acceptance from a journal and then collecting the data, which is what you do with a registered report. In Octopus, you publish every type of publication independently. And the eighth type of publication, if you're wondering what the eight in Octo is, is a review, a peer review. And they can be published attached to any other kind of publication. And they're treated and valued in the same way as other publications, because reviewing is a scientific skill just like any other. And by incentivizing it, we can encourage good reviewing. So this is what Octopus looks like at the moment. So across the top there, you can see the branching structure of linked publications. And it helps with navigation and discovery. You can see what other hypotheses are linked to a particular problem. You can see what other data sets have been collected according to the same method. And in fact, uh, funders could look, uh, sorry, we've got rating here as well on the right hand side. So we have rating on predefined criteria that allow us as a scientific community to define what good means for a particular type of publication. And we've got red flagging. Uh, Michael mentioned Elizabeth Bick. Well, here is an example of where you could flag content that is potentially plagiarism or it's um, any, any other kind of uh, it, real problem with the publication. And funders could look for well-rated and well-reviewed publications and offer to fund the next step, perhaps perhaps even offering funding to several groups simultaneously to carry it out, which would increase reproducibility. So I think there are, are so many things that would uh, change the way that we approach science just by breaking up this system and being able to have this rating system that gives us metrics that are closer to what we actually need. I mean, no metric is, is perfect, of course, it's always a proxy, but making metrics that are as close as what you mean as possible means that gaming is not quite such an issue. You're not encouraging people to maximize something you don't want them to maximize. But of course, we do also have reviews and that helps a lot. And everything that you do is linked to your profile. And unlike with the uh, CAVIS system, here we don't have anonymous or pseudonymous logins. Everything is done via your ORCID login, and that creates these profiles which allow any institution or any funder to instantly see what type of researcher you are. As Cave said, you know, are you an ideas person, a data collector, an analyst? Are you a good reviewer? What do people's peers think of you? Um, and so having these useful metrics that are then going to be used by funders and institutions hopefully provides a driving incentive for researchers to get their work into Octopus quickly and in the best form possible because all your ratings and reviews are visible to everybody else. So Octopus won't be a good read because it's not based around narrative and it's there for the detail. But that's where journals can then take over in the dissemination process and taking the content from Octopus and editorializing it for their specific audiences. So we have tried to build in benefits for all players within the scientific system, for researchers, for institutions, funders, and even for journals. And hopefully it creates a virtuous circle so that adoption kind of simultaneously by everybody makes the whole world better for everybody. So Octopus is now in partnership with JISC and the UK Reproducibility Network and has funding from Research England so that we're ready to launch next spring. So we are now in the run up to launch, um, which I hope will be a revolution for science. So thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Alex. That's super interesting. And, and I like what you said there when when we're looking at octopus it's it's not not a good read <laughs> but you know maybe that's not what's needed at that part of the of the research cycle right it's good research that's needed in the 
curation and the, the storytelling can come after. Um, right, well, that's uh, another great talk and some other questions that have come through, which we will ask towards the end. Um, I'd just now like to introduce our final speaker, uh, also joining us from, from the US. So thanks for getting up so early, Nate. Um, so yeah, Nate's the Chief Executive Officer of Flash Pub, um, and he's now going to tell us a little bit more about that and, and how that works. So floor's yours, Nate. Thanks, Michael. Um, let's share a screen here. And uh, yeah, just just real quick, you know, th thanks for organizing this, Michael and everybody else. Um, oh, where did everybody else go? Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, just, it's, it's, it's awesome being with, um, you know, basically everybody else that has these, these same really kind of like uh, future forward looking ideas. Um, you know, anybody that's starting new projects knows that, you know, a lot of times these, these are hard and you get a lot of criticism. So it's, it's great to really like be, you know, with your own kind and, and uh, um, you know, push all the ideas forward. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. So um, yeah, my name is Nate Jacobs. I have my um, PhD in neuroscience. Um, when I was in my postdoc, I just got really like a lot of the other people here got really frustrated with the publishing process and um, you know, just really took a hard left turn and, and, uh, to go into scholarly communication, open access advocacy, and um, to really explore and, and, and see where I could get with this concept of micropublications. Um, so uh, let's see, are we... Okay, so one of the main things that really motivates me and has, has driven me through, through a lot of this exploration is the idea that, um, you know, as much as 80% of research is never published. Um, and so this is true for me, you know, kind of varies by field and by person, but, you know, as a lot of the other speakers have said, there's just a lot that's not making it through that really high final, uh, you know, barrier or filter to, to get into the, the actual published record. Um, and so for me, what I'm really curious about is what story does all that other data tell? So, if, you know, like a whole bunch of labs across the world all have the same null result, but it never gets published because individually they all feel like, oh, it's not interesting enough to publish. That's a really interesting story there. I mean, so I just, I'm really curious about what all of that unpublished data, whether it's no results, whether it's um, a small finding that's really interesting, but you just can't sink two years into, uh, into get, turning it into a, a traditional publication. Um, there's just so much data there. And when you look at other you know, industries and other um, types of platforms, whenever you're allowing people to, to um, you know, express and get out those, um, you know, previously kind of untapped, you know, hidden potentials, just really interesting things happen and, and interesting stories happen. Um, so, you know, as, as everybody else has said, there's, you know, one of the main problems that we're really focused on is the, um, you know, these barriers to publications. It costs a lot of money to publish uh, in open access journals, it takes a really long time to review and to get it um, basically in front of people. Um, and again, this long format, um, um, it, it, in a lot of ways, um, it starts to dictate what, how you're doing the science um, and, and what you're actually communicating. And so as you change the um, that format and really narrow it down to these more atomized iterative bits, um, it sort of you know, frees you up to, to um, not let the narrative sort of uh, uh, dictate what, what it is you're sharing and, and letting that kind of come organically and naturally um, down the road. Um, so uh, we're, um, how do we kind of contextualize this? So we're, we're sort of mostly, in, in terms of our workflow, we're mostly similar to the micropublication.org folks. Um, we have, uh, we're really just focused on a, a format that is about the length of a single figure. Um, and we are also really interested in the linking and I'll talk about it in a bit, but um, we're somewhat agnostic to how that, how that linking can happen. Um, and so, um, so when, when Alex was talking about that module, that's like kind of a, a, a very nice uh, structured um, um, linking for the content. Um, and we're a little bit more agnostic to that. Um, but yeah, but just to kind of really quickly go over um, just the individual unit, the micro, micro publication part, we are also really interested in uh, um, um, having authors create a structured claim um, and, and really wrap their, um, their communication around that single claim. So a single result, a single method, a single observation. Um, and as Paul mentioned, we're also um, struggling with and, and just really curious about how to, um, how to achieve those UX hurdles for that structured data. It's a, it's a really, really big um, UX problem. And so um, we're also trying to get authors to jump through those hoops at the time of, of, of authorship um, before, it, before it gets published. We also are probably going to have to do a bit of what he was talking about, where you're sort of like um, reducing those those barriers and then trying to capture some of that after the fact, and then having them, you know, kind of like uh, accept or reject that. Um, so that's just a big a big challenge here. We can uh, maybe talk about in the Q and A. Um, uh, but again, single figure, uh, a brief description of the results. Um, uh, essentially, we wanted to read like a result section. 
Um, but then all the detailed methods can just be linked out to what, so it's protocols, data, um, um, code, all that can be linked out to, so you can get to it and go through all those details, but it's not, um, it's not, uh, going to kind of weigh down the, the, the length of that paper. Um, and, uh, you know, we're basically diamond OA, you know, free to publish, free to read, um, and trying to structure as much of that as possible to help with the, the linking in the downstream, um, 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 sort of features. So, um, yeah, so this is the part that we're really digging into now is how do you link these all together? And I think this could be a really interesting topic in, in the Q&A as well, just to kind of see how everybody else is, is approaching this. Um, we have taken an approach where we want um, authors to really um, imagine their um, project, not as a, you know, if you get some results and there's, there's something interesting happening, um, you know, instead of saying, okay, now I need to like go through all these steps to get to that final publication and in a couple of years I'll get my nature or whatever, really imagining that project and that process as a open collaborative workflow and figure out how to, in the same way that you do this with a GitHub repo with code, how do you structure that, that vision and those, those aims so that you can then get those results out, start to visualize them and allow other people to pour in and, and to, uh, uh, to contribute their results as well and to get to that, um, that narrative, that, that research story at the community level um, where you're having just, just a much more robust narrative that is validated and uh, contributed by a much broader swath of, uh, of labs. So, um, you know, one of the things we're experimenting with here is just, it's like really simple, but um, visualizing multiple results in the same shared space. So if you're trying to calculate, you know, infection fatality rate of COVID, um, these are point estimates that a lot of different people have done. How do you organize a collaborative effort where um, they're being reported in a way where it's easy to suck them in and just plot them in the same place? And, um, um, you know, there's just a lot of, this, this is a mock-up, this is not, this is not real data here. Um, oh, I guess this is, I'm sorry, this is vaccine efficacy, but, but same sort of idea, um, where the story emerges not from the individual article, but through multiple contributions and mul multiple micro-publications across different labs. And it doesn't have to be a neat story, right? It can be, you know, uh, 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 the, you know, vaccine, the certain vaccine works in a very specific population, um, but then it's totally doesn't work in some other, um, other situation or context. And so you can, um, you know, basically get a sense for what, what the story is by plotting it in parameter states and then directly uh, juxtapositioning the different results. Um, so we, uh, our main uh, platform that we have been working on is uh, Outbreak for Inve Infectious Disease Informatics. We did a bit of an experiment sort of at the beginning of the pandemic and then um, learned, a, learned a ton. And then we've sort of been consolidating and, and sort of reworking some of the foundations and we're um, planning to relaunch in 2022. Um, and some of the things we're working on are um, uh, coming up with more community tailored and specifically structured uh, uh, research campaigns. So um, I'll just kind of just go through these really quickly, but um, there's different types of dashboards and ways to kind of aggregate those results that just uh, will be a little bit more turnkey for, um, for people in that specific community to, to, to get going with. So disease characteristics, you can basically have a dashboard where um, you're just reporting like infection fatality rate, um, uh, what's the incubation period, things like that. Um, uh, there's also a lot of, um, in terms of forecasting uh, work, there's uh, ensemble workflows. So this is a really powerful way to, um, to get more robust forecasts. Um, if you guys followed along, you know, a rec lab and people like that. Uh, there's also the scenario hub that's just coming out um, um, from, other, from other groups. Um, but yeah, but we want to structure that so that each individual um, contribution can be a micro publication and then that dashboard can, can help synthesize and, and bring it together and then also um, um, report the ensemble analysis results also as a micro publication in this kind of real time dynamic way. Um, we're also working on a reproducibility campaign where you can take a traditional article and then break it up into its different findings and results. And then people can micro publish their replications or, or contradictions to that um, in sort of an organized way. And then the last one we're, we're working on is just a, a wayfinding campaign where um, you can just have really open-ended buckets. Um, you know, pick a topic and say, hey, let's publish methods on this. Let's publish some initial results um, and some other things. Um, but having it be very, very unstructured and just kind of giving people buckets to start forming that initial community around a particular topic. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, uh, again, this is something that I'd be really interested to, to, to talk with um, the other um, other projects and then the, the community in the Q and A, but I, I really have a strong feeling that um, you know micro publications really uh, uh, um, how do I put this? Um, 
they're sort of like open native, like they're, they're really designed for this more modern open um, um, system um, that, that's developing around web and other things. Um, and so this idea of just really reducing those financial barriers and, 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 and really opening up that content, I think is going to lead to just a lot of really interesting, unexpected um, um, workflow disruption. So, you know, while we're, we're, you know, creating a platform where uh, micro publications can be published, authored and maybe even some of that initial data visualization is happening on our platform. I'm really interested in how, you know, once you start opening all this up with APIs, how it gets integrated into other people's dashboards, how you could potentially um, embed a micro publication in a, a longer article. Um, so maybe it's the first figure, but then the rest of the figures are happening in a traditional format. Um, and, you know, just making all this very machine accessible so that people can use it in meta analysis and things like that. And, and I'm also just genuinely curious to see where all this goes. I think you know, th these, these sorts of things always take uh, twists and turns, and I'm just, I'm, I'm really curious to see where, where it all leads. Um, like, like a lot of uh, the other people I've mentioned, uh, you know, there's sort of this, like, this natural trend towards smaller, more atomized, uh, more iterative content from books to articles to micropublications. And um, I also really strongly believe that uh, where this is headed is micropublications or, or things similar to that are going to become the primary record. So, you know, before you had you know, journals and articles, a lot of that was happening in books. And then uh, journals came out and it was this faster, more dynamic way to communicate results that required sort of its own um, organizational structure, journals and things like that. Um, and that's been built up over the last hundred years. And now I think we're seeing everything pushing further into smaller content, micropublications, Twitter, these, th these sorts of things. And, um, you know, and I think there's a lot of challenges around how do we uh, as a community, organize around that and make sure that we're building the infrastructure and having the, the community and the network connections to um, to really build up this as the primary um, initial first uh, first touch on new research results. Because I think that's what that's what everybody wants. It should come out, you know, on Twitter on a micro publication platform, something fast and rapid and iterative before it it you know gets into a journal. And and you know, for me, the long term vision is to have journal articles really just become mostly review articles um, with very little new information being shared in that in that um, longer, slower format. Um, okay, just yeah, we, we're still we're a small startup with, with big big ambitions, but um, you know we're we're getting there. We have a really great advisory board. Just thanks to everyone that's you know kind of uh, worked with us. And um, um, yeah, if you if anyone's interested in talking, um, my Twitter handle is Nada Jacobs. Uh, you can also email me. Um, we're um, primarily looking um, at just kind of building out our, our partner network for the for the outbreak journal we're trying to launch or relaunch. Um, we're also rebuilding our um, kind of our open source dev team. So um, if you're a developer, get in touch. And um, we're also really interested in the um, kind of the scholarly uh, infrastructure ecosystem side of this. I think there's just a lot of really interesting experiments and pilots to do in terms of where does a publisher stop and where does like the library, the, the infrastructure start? And I think there's a lot of um, 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 uh, aspects where we could kind of have community kind of more uh, community kind of organized um, resources such as um, things on the more on the structured data side and the, and the knowledge databases. Um, I think that it's really important to have some of those those separations as um, as Alex was saying. You want to um, kind of do division of labor and make sure that we're we're contributing to a cross-platform, um, um, you know, kind of decentralized, uh, robust um, 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 preservation system. So, um, yeah, so that's that's us. And I'm uh, happy to take questions and to chat about some of these uh, issues in the Q&A. Great. Thanks for that, Nate. And uh, yeah, it leads really nicely on to the, to the Q&A session. We've had quite a lot of questions. And, um, you know, from what I've taken from all four talks is that, you know, there's lots of information that isn't being recorded or published in a way that that that, that it might be. Uh, and and as Nate just said, you know, if we started with the books and the journals, and then is there now a space for something that's more smaller and and potentially more information rich? Uh, but one of the questions that we've had from the panel on here, um, which uh, Kave says said he would like to answer, but I think it's 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 pretty poignant for everyone is. Do this, does the panel think it will be a challenge for researchers to find these published outputs uh, that are relevant to them? And if we if we have more and more micro publications, i.e., do you think it's going to be information overload? So, Kave, I'll let you kick off. I think actually I I clicked but by mistake on that. I didn't know what. That oh, okay. Meant. But okay. I'm happy, ha happy to answer. So it's about having too much information. Is that right? Things being split up everywhere. Yeah, I don't think that's the problem because the if you look at um, 
look at Twitter, look at uh, Facebook. There is uh, there's so much information now. We don't we don't or look at for example the ex example idea of Stack Exchange. There is a phenomenal amount of information there, but it's very easy to go to where you want because everything is tagged, everything is separated. I know I, I'm interested in tech or R programming, and even within that, you have tags. So everyone tags, and if I don't tag a question, firstly, I get downrated. I got it, first time I went there, I put a, a question in, and I got a thumb down because I didn't say which program I'm using, silly me. So I, I got a smack for that. But someone else did tag it. So everything is tagged, and I don't think it's a problem. It's actually easier to go there. Right now, I think to get what you want in a paper, it's it's more difficult because you have to go to Google, Google Scholar, is this right, is this not right? Uh, then maybe pay $36, maybe then that's not right, maybe pay another. So I don't think it'll be a problem. Yeah, I think the thing is that, so we, um, as papers got more complicated, complex, um, we started doing sentence level text mining of full text, including supplemental material, and that allows you to get information out. but. In the, in the past, when the papers were simpler, the title of the paper told you what was in it, mm -hmm. right? A sticks to B, you know? A is, is an outbreak of A in city B, right? And then that's the story, right? So the more granular, the easier it is to find by indexing it quickly, and you don't actually have to go pay your $36 or whatever or, or click through, right? Um, so, you know, there, it's not the only answer, but it helps in a, in, a, in a lot in a lot of ways. And so my, my question to you on that, then, Paul, do you think that these should be indexed in places that are similar to where journals are, so people can have a whole holistic view of, of, of micro publications and, in this instance, the macro publications? Or do you think micro publications need their own kind of database or, or kind of area where people can find them? I think so. I think it depends on where you draw the, the boundaries. The we, you know, as as someone pointed out, that we're you know the micropublication biology is um, is really you know a light. It's going to be a journal using a, a conventional journal type concept that researchers are familiar with and are comfortable with, and therefore that can be indexed. And we are right. So you know, funding requires PubMed Central. If you're an NIH funded, that's that's there. Now as you get more granular, you know, and, and you do what really are micro publications, what I might call a nano publication of an RDF triple, you, yeah. you really have to do that in a database. So I think there's, um, it's, it's interesting to see the, you know, exploration of how granular you want to get. Um, right. I, so, yeah, I think, I, I think we, sh it still needs, there's lots of room for just really Im imagining from scratch how you want to do things. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're probably still all limited in you know pragmatism. <laughs> so, Paul, like, do you see we, um, yeah. where do you see that happening? Because that's a, that's something that I kind of wrestle with a lot. This concept of like what should happen on like a publisher platform versus like what should be kind of like community infrastructure cross platform. Like where do you kind of draw that line in terms of like you know if you you, you imagine this as knowledge bases. Um, uh, yeah, what's the relationship between kind of individual platforms and those knowledge bases? Like, do you think there should be an effort to um, kind of make sure that there's kind of interop you know, there's interoperability, but if like multiple platforms are kind of pu pu pulling into the, pushing into the same knowledge base and like in terms of like governance, do you have kind of thoughts on the governance? I, I don't have any answers there. I'm just sort of something that I actively think about. Yeah, I, I mean, the governments, that's interesting, um, you know, think about, but really it's, there already are places that are large enough in certain mm -hmm. fields, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have these big, field big specific, attractions. Yeah, that's a good point. They're field specific. So genetics, yeah. you know, cell biology, you know, neuroscience is kind of um, all over the, you know, it's all over the place and too distributed. Um, sociology, probably the same thing. Law actually has good, law and chemistry, I think are in good shape for the, you know, they're driven by economics over many decades, right? So there, there's places where that knowledge is, is kept in index. So I think it depends. I guess what a highlight would be for, for groups where there isn't a place to put it, then that should, that should emerge and maybe we can mm -hmm. help, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we feel like we, we started out and said, look, we don't want to publish anything that isn't linked to a knowledge base, but there's lots of pushback because it turns out a lot of people are sort of out there on their own without the infrastructure. So we started- But then, that, yeah, but then that, like, yeah, maybe th that, that work itself just then stimulates that to happen and like to, for that to, 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 yeah, which is awesome, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, but I think well, you know the way you're approaching it, your interoperability with APIs, it's it's interoperable. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you set out with that mindset, it's not going to be that hard compared to other things. Is yeah. it seamless? Is it easy? You know, okay, someone's got to do it, but there's too many different views. You know, mm -hmm. um, a few views are good. You know, hundreds of views of the same stuff is is a little too confusing and waste of effort. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. So I've, we've got a couple of questions specifically for, for Alex here about Octopus. So I'll start with the first one, Alex. And um, the question is, if different fields end up with different platforms, it could potentially limit or stall the kind of cross-specialty collaboration or the interdisciplinary uh, nature of research. Um, it sounds like Octopus has been designed not to be field specific. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So in Octopus, it's designed for the whole of STEM. Um, not for the arts and humanities. Um, slightly ambitious, probably, to try and put the whole of science into one place, but, you know, that's that's me. Um, I think it's important because I think, as you were talking about, having stuff distributed over lots of different platforms makes it much diff more difficult to find stuff. And because the octopus structure is a specific branching chains of knowledge, then having it all in octopus helps build those chains and avoids you having gaps. Um, so, uh, but the one thing that I wanted to point out that I hadn't had a chance to discuss is that Octopus also incentivizes what I call horizontal linking. So if as a reader you're reading a publication and you think, actually, I know another publication that this or another field or another problem that this would uh, this publication would help with. So say it's an algorithm developed in uh, oil fields that would be really useful in biology. You can make a horizontal link. And by suggesting that link, when other researchers then follow that link, they get to vote on whether they think that was a good link or not. So that kind of interdisciplinary thinking is also incentivized. And um, yeah, I think that will help because I'm very much an anti-silo person, especially given my own career spans many dis disciplines. So Alex, have you done any, any um, do you have a sense of how many users you need to get that, the the sort of validate mm -hmm. cross connections because i think it's really exciting i'm sure somebody yeah. can do some modeling on it um like a power calculation of how many research yeah i want to power cal right right because yeah. i think the thing was it was like the faculty of a thousand um you know when i started out i i, I immediately said what well, it should be the faculty of ten thousand, or it's not going to work yeah, yeah. right yeah. and it expanded but that was right because you need a certain critical mass to get those comments right yeah so um, there are a few things that were, so because every publication in Octopus has to be linked to an existing one, you can't start with a blank database. So the first thing that we're doing at the moment is using natural language processing to take problems out of the existing open access literature and hierarchically cluster them into an ironic backbone for Octopus. So that when we launch, there are already problems that people can initially uh, attach their research to. But what we'll also do is link in the papers that those problems came from so that from day one, Octopus is a useful place to find research, existing research, now clustered by problem, which I don't think has been done before. And then they can start writing reviews. And I think from that, you will start getting the workflow. I hope. It's one of the many things that I'm hoping will start to drive use of Octopus. That's good. Yeah, good. That's a good. Excellent. <laughs> There's this one follow-up question to that, uh, which is more of a, a philosophical one uh, about octopus. But in general, I think I think anyone uh, everyone can answer too. Is do we find the idea of telling a story uh, when we're publishing problematic? So you know, do, do we necessarily need that that narrative, and, and would we be better off with just the the research information itself? So I, I love this question because I had a career in narrative and then once I changed career, I suddenly thought of narrative as the spawn of the devil and uh, leading us all astray. And as humans, I totally get that we love a story and a story is brilliant. And what struck fear into my heart was hearing my postdoc saying, what story are we telling with this data? Because you have to tell a story to get a pub paper published. And I suddenly thought, well, hang on a minute, I'm not sure I like the idea of what story we're telling, because that means that we develop a narrative and we then are under pressure to make that narrative nice and clean and, you know, all the things that I as a journalist or a media person would have wanted to do with a story. You know, I'm practically setting my papers to music now. You know, it's, 
it drives questionable research practices. It makes you want to cherry pick and eliminate inconveniences and not tell about the failures as well as the successes. successes. Um, so yes, I think storytelling is massively problematic and I don't think we notice it as being as problematic as it is because it feels such an inherently beautiful thing to us because it's so attractive as a reader. Um, and all that media training that you've had telling you how to tell a story as a scientist. Just think about what you're doing. It's not necessarily perfect evidence communication. And it's all very well if you have chosen a story and you are telling a story and that is your aim. But if you are trying to communicate with your peers, what you've actually done is a story, the right thing to be telling. Um, if I can... Oh, go for it. You sure? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we agree on this, that the, the, you know, the, the sort of what I talked about, for example, if you go to say Stack Exchange, um, there is no story there. It's just bits of information that connect with one another. But I believe the story, we all love stories. I told you the story of, you know, I kept people, perhaps if I was successful, uh, interested because I told the story of, of, of my research. But we should disconnect that from the research. So we do need stories and we need publishers and journalists and, and people like Alex who can tell a story in her uh, other life. But keep that separate. So keep doing the research very fast, but keep telling stories too so that everyone understands, the general public understands and the fellow scientists understands what happened. Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off that, there, like, if, I think Twitter is a great example of this. There, there are still a lot of stories happening on Twitter. It's just a different way of telling stories, right? And and at the end of the day, you maybe have something that synthesizes that story into something that's a, a neat, clean, like blog post or, or a news article. But it's all happening on Twitter, right? And you're 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 getting that story piece by piece. So there's still very much our stories. It's just removing the burden of one lab from telling a big full story and saying you know it's almost like you know making yourself vulnerable it's like i can't tell this story all, all to myself and, and i shouldn't try to be the hero let's get out what i know and then put that in and then the story will kind of emerge over time and so i think i you know i think it's hard to get away from storytelling because if you if you try to run away from it people will just start telling their own stories um, and so you know i think you want to lead into that a little bit and just make sure that you're doing it in the most um kind of scientifically rigorous way possible and i think that's really what micropublication solve is a way to tell stories in a more iterative, evolving, cross-lab way that at the end of the day is going to be much more robust than one lab trying to be the hero and telling that full story. So, Yeah, and there's a quick question that's followed up to that um, that's come up, which is a, which is a good one, really, that, that I always kind of think in my head, don't we need the stories, though, to kind of change practice and to engage policymakers and, and NGOs and things like that? Don't, don't we need the totally story? Different. I mean, that is a totally different environment, isn't it? When you're talking to practitioners and you are trying to be persuasive, you're not trying to inform it. Somebody once put it nicely as, you know, when you're writing to impress instead of writing to express. And, you know, I think these are these are very, very different kinds of communication. And if you want to try and persuade a policymaker or or some some other person, you've got to go, OK, I am now putting on a persuasive hat. I am trying to tell them a story and I want to lead them to a particular conclusion. If I'm showing somebody my research process and my research data or whatever I've done, I shouldn't necessarily, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be telling people a story to lead them to a conclusion. I should be telling them what happened and letting them draw their own conclusions or flagging it as these are, this is my interpretation of this data. Somebody else can have a different interpretation. Here is the data. Interpret it yourself as well. So I think yeah. they're very different, but I do also think that scientists should be very careful mm -hmm. about um, telling stories to policy makers. Sorry, very, very quick point, if I may, very important is also, in my view, is that people work best when they're doing something they're passionate about and they enjoy. There are people like my colleague, Mike Forshaw, he, he could write a paper very quickly. He, was, he could tell a story. Uh, let's let the people who can really tell stories tell the stories. And, and the people, if you like, someone who is, is dyslexic or, or, or autistic, say, and wants to be in the lab, let them work in the lab, then it's more efficient. Yeah, but a lot, I think that one of, the, one of the barriers in practice came in a question from Phil, Philip Eagle about uh, information and how people want, how guarded people are with that is, 
that mm -hmm. people often want to tell the story themselves, mm -hmm. right? So if you say, well, put your, you know, you, you suck at interpretation, but you're really good at, at collecting data, collect data and put it on octopus, okay? Right? And then a lot of people are going to go, no, I'm not going to do that, right? So I think it's, you know, there, there's a cultural shift, right? So I, I think, but I would say, you know, it's um, some people want to sit on information for years. It's their, they, they can do that. It's about how pleasurable it is. So it's, it's, you don't have to get it one size fits all, right? But yeah, Ben, just to kind of piggyback off of that, I mean, I think that when you look at things like GitHub and, and stories that emerge on Twitter, you know, there's sort of two models, right? Like, yeah, you can sit on it, but like if, if micro publication these faster forms, you're going to get beat, like you're going to get scooped by the crowd. And so I think leading into that is going to be really interesting and powerful. And, I, and that's why it's good to have, you know, yeah, all these platforms pushing on it. Yeah. And I think everybody has different motivations and different, you know, incentives and the feedback is amazing. I mean, I think that, you know, the peer, the peer review preprint, uh, platforms are really encouraging for people you know they, they they they're not getting any feedback from desk rejections from journals and then they get feedback from their peers from mm -hmm. some peers right um yeah. it's just the, the real the you know the issue about the peer the open peer review has just been how many people are going to do it right and but, and then, but you see during the pandemic i mean just i mean i know there's a big spotlight because of the pandemic but just watching twitter review i mean it was amazing to see that process happen so rapidly for both preprints and published journals and really, really prestigious venues just getting, you know, <laughs> ripped to shreds for lack of a better word and, and really getting to the science quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I No, I, that's right. So the question, I mean, as, as for many things in the pandemic, including Zoom meetings, et cetera, you know, and, and this, are, how, how much of that's going to be maintained? And hopefully yeah, yeah, some yeah, of yeah, that yeah. is a good part. Because I do think, I agree with you about the Twitter reviews, that there was actually pretty powerful and helpful to people. Yeah, but without that huge spotlight, yeah, I'm also curious about it too. But it's also just a good demonstration. It's kind of a little bit like breaking the ice and then, you know, like kind yeah. of yeah, well, no, normalizing good, it. Good point. Good point, Nate. Yeah. So I've got another question, which uh, it's a little bit, I'll, I'll kind of reframe it because I think it is is a question that that, is, that continually comes up for, for a lot of researchers and it, it's kind of around the incentives of doing this, right? Um, some academics that I speak to uh, told not to salami slice and, 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 and Julia in the, in the chat has also said that. So, so not to uh, do micro publications, get your fully fledged story, Alex, and make sure you're telling that correctly. Uh, but then in some, some countries and in some uh, research environments, it's publish often, publish more, and you get credit for quantity over quality. So I think the big question is, depending on what type of micro publication it is, how do we get them recognized by those that matter most, i.e. the funding institutes uh, and also the, the funders themselves? So um, maybe I'll, I'll kick off with uh, Cave. Random choice there. Um, <laughs> um, I think at least the way I look at it, if you look at, say, firstly, on the salami slicing, the, the way I looked at salami slicing was maybe it's a, it's a different, it's a sort of opposite analogy, is when you have some research and you think, uh, hey, I can get two papers out of this. Uh, now, here I'm now big enough and old enough to, 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 to uh, admit I have done that myself. There was a paper I was going to write called Dispersion Compensation in Holograms. Uh, and I thought, hang on, I can, I can have two papers. So I had, I wrote a paper. It was actually a conference uh, uh, thing, uh, presentation. Uh, and one was uh, dispersion compensation in transmission holograms. Then I presented dispersion compensation in reflection holograms. Horrible thing to do. But I, you know, I had two, two publications out of it uh, for one. So that is a bad thing to do, and we should we should discourage that. <clears throat> um, as far as getting the uh, recognition, I think on the site that, uh, for example, Stack Exchange I'm looking at is just for me it's perfect. the The voting system is is hard to game, and if someone's done something immediately, your peers will say no, that's been done before. It doesn't have to go all the way to peer review and missed by some guy who has or some person who hasn't got time to do it. So it actually is less, it's actually easier to give credit to right people. Okay, I'm going to pose it to Alex as well then. How how do we think, and, and Octopus has got some funding from UKRI, how are UKRI going to look at Octopus and, and be able to maybe potentially 
uh, associate uh, some, some research that's documented in Occupus to, to one of their grantees, for example. Yeah, so, um, I mean, part of designing Octopus is to design it such that the incentives drive usage. So it's designed to have metrics that, as I said, are as close as possible to what we can get that defines good and to make those metrics as available as possible and as useful as possible to the institutions and to the funders that might want to use them so that you create the virtuous circle. So we're working with and talking to institutions about their structures we're talking to funders about what might be helpful for them so that we can design octopus i mean it's open source so obviously anybody can create plugins um, to design it to integrate with their existing systems and talking to as many people as possible i mean as you say it's very useful to have a major funder backing it so that that's on somebody on board to start with but, you know, talking to other funders and to charities and people who put money forwards. And as I mentioned, you can design the system such that it also removes resource implications for funders. You know, the whole peer reviewing of protocols and, you know, grant applications is a ridiculous waste of resources for both for funders and for people applying for grants. So if you can improve that system through allowing people to just use Octopus and then fund us to say we've got funding available for people to use this well rated, well reviewed protocol, then you're making everybody's lives better. So I think it's, um, yeah, I'm hoping that through doing a lot of talking to people and a lot of working out how it can integrate and make everybody's lives better, you can drive usage. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fully, fully agree with that. Um, and Paul, I'll, I'll probably ask you because, because uh, if I'm right in saying micro, uh, publication biology is indexed in, in PubMed Central, so it kind of has a, a, a journal, journal-like yeah. mm -hmm. um, um, kind of credential to it. Does that help with um, the kind of incentives to get authors to publish, but then also people being able to be recognised because their their micro publication uh, in micro publication biology is actually a tangible research. Yeah, article. right, right. So the, I mean, so the, the issues, you know, come up with saying, well, I get tenure for if I have these micro publications. And I said, I don't know, it's conceivable, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I no, publish somewhere else. Go, go for, you know, nature tier seven or whatever it is. Um, right. So, you know, the, um, but I think, no, that makes it tangible. That's, but I think that's, is, you know, it's deliberate because we want, we want it to be useful and make it and be very pragmatic and have it fit in the conventional academic workflow. So that means that we are, that is a constraint, right? So it's not getting updated in real time. And there's a lot of things that some of these other platforms could do, right? So yeah, it's conventional. The question is people say, what's the CV value? And I said, well, it's equivalent to you put in one figure, one panel in a paper and you're the fifth author, right? Mm -hmm. It's valuable. Is it going to float the boat? Probably not. Right. Um, but, you know, I would say that in the past, the papers, you know, they were simpler. Right. I mean, they're, <laughs> I have nature letters, that, you know, I, I don't, the, my full version of the talk, I go through sort of the evolution of a nature letter from 53 to, to now, and it just keeps, it's, it's, a, it's uncanny. Right. Yeah. So, right. I mean, that I would, I would have loved to see for, for Alex is, you know, if the funders come in and say, oh, that's a nice problem, Paul. We want to give you money to study that. See, that would be really nice. Well, what they might cool do is say, that's a nice problem, Paul. We're offering money for people to study that. And then you yeah, 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 say... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pose that to you as well, Nate. So, so on FlashPub, how yeah. are you hoping people get incentivized? And, and... Yeah, so I, I agree with someone what I said and kind of disagree with other parts. I think, <clears throat> to me, micropublications, sort of by definition, are at that individual contribution level, letting go of that idea of like, okay, I'm telling the full story, I'm gonna get like massive credit for this and really just like embracing the fact that you're doing this sort of iterative atomized contribution. And I think um, the goal there is to then not get, um, you know, the, that, that prestige and that like, that sort of leadership or, or whatever, you know, kind of a, a career advancement at that individual contribution level, you're sort of admitting that that's gonna happen after the fact, it's gonna emerge and evolve over time through kind of organic growth. If you think about, um, like a New York Times uh, columnist versus somebody that's like, you know, uh, putting stuff out on Twitter, you know, each tweet is not going to make you, you know, like a leader in a field. It's your kind of like uh, uh, engaged, active leadership on particular topics 
continuing to drive home points, uh, being really like rigorous and dedicated to the truth, whichever twists and turns it takes. You know, you're not going to get, you know, in the New York Times with that one individual contribution. You're actively uh, earning that as you go through it and you're adding to it. And I think that that that's the shift model, right? It's like you don't get that nature paper. You get recognized by through all of these interactions, through all of the, the review and people seeing your work and then also adding their own. You're sort of like the spearhead of that. You're, you're like the GitHub uh, repo owner, if you will. Um, and I think that's really what, what you want to be thinking about is how do I become a leader in this field or on this topic um, and then do that through active um, and, and repeated and frequent and, and high volume communications. Um, and that also kind of dovetails with as that as those stories emerge and as consensus emerges, um, you know, if you really were um, the driver and, and main contributor to that, like that'll be recognized. I think people have a lot of sort of, you know, BS detectors and they, they know who's real, they know who's genuine, they know who's, um, you know, when they get things wrong saying, hey, I got this wrong, I need to retract this. I think people over the course of time, and if you're really tuned in, um, you see all that. And I think that that allows you, the, the, what these platforms allow you to do is, is to rise to that leadership role um, in a much different way, a completely different, a more organic, um, a more rapid way than you have done in the past. So I think it is a bit of a paradigm shift, but um, but yeah, it does, as Paul was saying, it, it takes it takes a, a mental paradigm shift to, to think about it in that way. And I'm, what I'm hoping we'll see is over time, the prestige of a nature paper will just slowly go down um, and then these more organic, real-time um, kind of prestige career advance, advancement models will, will rise as, as it happens. And I think there's going to be a role for both going forward, but, um, but I think we really just need to like experiment and explore that, that new um, model. And you, you see examples of this, you know, in social media, right? Like, like I'm saying, there's a New York Times article and then there's like, you know, the blogger and the, and the, you know, the person that's really becoming famous through, through Twitter. And it's not about being famous. It's more about getting that story right and like becoming a leader in whatever that, whatever your community is. Um, and I think you can also be a leader in different ways. I think a lot of people have touched on kind of this assembly, not assembly line, but like people excelling at different things. So maybe you're a leader in, in methods or you're a leader in interpretation or you're just really good at coming up with that hypothesis. I think that there's, this allows you to have that space to be a leader in that, that domain that you're, that you can excel at. Amazing. I think you have to wait I, for I the, next gen, the, the next generation will decide, right? So if you grew up with books and then journals and photos, photocopying, you know, it's not really, we, we, we really can't predict what's going to happen. I, I would say you got to go back to the youngsters who grew up in a very different world, a different mm -hmm. pace and their and demands and information and they'll just, and they'll will decide how, how things should be done. So if yeah. we can try to o open it up enough. So just to let them can, see what they do with it. That's, I think that's a great. Let, <laughs> yeah. Give them choices and let them do yeah. it and then step and, you know, hopefully step out of the way or die or whatever. I mean, you know, <laughs> the academic way of, you know, holding on till the end, but yeah. I think, and I think that's a good way to put it. Paul. Like we don't know what's going to happen, and so just like creating these other options, and then and then seeing, and then empowering people to do like when things are working, empowering them, and then yeah. So maybe I'll wrap up then, um, and you know I think we could talk about this a lot longer, but we are getting close to the end of time. Just from from each of each of the the, pa uh, the panelists, just to to say where do we think micro publications are going to be in the next five years and, and these could be as could be as blue sky as you wish um but um just to get your uh, thoughts as 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 a uh, as people who are already trying different ways of, of disseminating research so um start with you alex i think um I mean, five years is a really long time. Um, <laughs> however slow and slow to adopt the scientific and publishing communities can be, I think five years is a very long time. And I think that there is now an increasing recognition that things need to be faster and that things need to be easier, that we can't all take like six weeks out to write up a paper. We need to be getting on with the actual work. And that things need to we need to break the uh, narrative that that drives people to want to prove a hypothesis in a lot of fields. So I think those three things, time, resources and questionable research practices will drive the uptake of smaller units of publication in some way. And I think okay. in far less than five years, I'd say two. Very well put. And I think I can get behind all of that too. Cave, what's your thoughts on this? You're on mute. Press the space bar. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I should do that. Um, I, I, I prefer not to, to I, I sort of uh, not, not say a, a number there. Um, 
it really, it's just, uh, to me, it seems everything is there. Everything is there. So it's, it's not up to me. It's up to funders, researchers, institutions to see if, if this is a good idea or not. We've, we've put the case. If it doesn't happen, if it happens in 10 years' time, who knows? Uh, so, sorry, I'm being on the fence, but I don't know. I just, but we keep thinking, how can we do th things better? How can we do this things faster and allow people to do what they love and what they enjoy? That, for me, that's the driving force. You know, put the, the person who writes, I hate writing papers, but I had to do it. And I, did, I had to go to courses on how to write an abstract. Leave me alone. I don't want to write an abstract. I want to be in the lab pottering about because that's where I can, you know, maybe I can discover something else. Who knows? Yeah, I can get, I get, get behind that thought as well. Um, Paul? I think, that, you know, there's a lot of pent up demand and, and for, for changes in scholarly communication. So I think if we provide the, a way forward, people are gonna, gonna try it and see what works. And I think it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen fast. So we actually, last year we published, I think 5% of, in my little field, 5% of the papers were in micropublication biology. And they're probably add-ons. They're probably not replacing conventional, you know, larger, longer publications, but there are, you know, new information that wouldn't have gotten published. So, Excellent. So I think yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah. It's happening. But we need more, you know, more experiments are good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then finally, Nate. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, five years is a long time, but it's <laughs> really, really slowly. I think the way that I'm thinking about it is kind of a, on a community by community basis. I think that when you looked at like transformations to OA, that's sort of how things happened. You'd have like a community that really got pushed over the edge for one reason or another, and then just they either liked the editorial staff left, or there was some precipitating catalyst that kind of flipped that community. Because a lot of it is, is those peer interactions. Um, so I would really like to see in five years um, one, just more kind of awareness and people just experimenting with it across, you know, across the board. But then I would really like to see a couple of, you know, fairly high profile community flips where they really like said, okay, this is awesome. Let's, we're going to lean into this in the same way that, you know, pre -pre this also happens with preprints where you kind of had these communities flip over, um, um, and really just embrace it and, and really integrate it into the workflow. And so, um, Paul, it's really cool to hear that that it's up to about 5%. I think that once we get to 5 to 10%, I think there's some like critical thresholds there where it becomes accepted enough where you go from the early adopters into more mainstream. And so um, that's really promising. And, and maybe that will be one of the first communities that flips. Um, and hopefully, you know, each of us and or, or other people that are listening here um, will, will spearhead this in their own communities and have, uh, you know, in five years, really, really solid examples from all the way from you know, um, you know, micro publishing to um, establishing yourself as leader to integrating in with traditional forms of communication like the uh, journal articles and, and that sort of thing, um, and also going all the way through to funding. So um, you did the micro publishing thing, you established yourself as your leader that helped you get the grant and go full cycle, but it's going to be kind of community by community. And so I, I think, um, and so I just would like to see at, in five years, um, and I think we're going to get there. I think we'll, I think we'll have a few really good examples and then that can help then kind of, in the same way that preprints kind of snowballed across different fields, um, mm -hmm. you'll start getting that that sort of effect happening. But these things take a long time. So, I mean, I think, I don't know, maybe more 10 to 20 year horizon, but um, don't get discouraged. Keep keep pushing. Um, you got to, yeah, <laughs> one step at a time. Exactly. Well, all I can say is thanks to, to all the speakers here. We've, I think we've had a really good conversation some really cool things going on uh, and I implore everyone to, to have a, a further delve into to each of the things that we've heard about today. Uh, before we leave, I would just like to say a big thanks to Kate Beebe, who's done all of the, the getting the webinar together, making sure that we're all here. I did see the participants list was was it was in over 100 uh, at its peak, which is which is really great for, for an online webinar. So thanks to all that's joined. Uh, and also thanks to Frank, who, who again has come up with the topic and, and, and brought the speakers together. Um, just a little plug for Open Research London, um, uh, a group of researchers, libra librarians, um, and anyone else who's ever interested in, in open research. Um, there is a mailing list that you can follow. Uh, if you follow the Twitter account, um, you can click a link to the mailing list, join us. Uh, and if you have any other ideas on anything else you would like to discuss, uh, open research related, uh, we're always ears uh, to hear that. So um, without further ado, thanks again, everyone for joining us. And um, yeah, thanks for, the, for everyone participating too. Um, have a good rest of the morning to some of the speakers and uh, I think I'm probably going to 
wind the day in. Um, see you later, everybody. Yeah, I wish Thank I could have at a pub. Anyway, great to, uh, to share the platform. Bye, Nate. Bye, Alex. Bye, bye, bye Alex. Bye, 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 Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank, Thank you. you.